What's happened today? Yes, yes, the throne is back. The throne is back. I've had to bring the throne back for this interview. This is going to be fun. Very, very excited. We've got Grant, the uh, co-director of the highest of stakes here, and we're going to get into a lot of interesting content. It's going to be fun. I got not only do I have brought back the throne today. Anyone recognize this? This is I hope people recognize it. I might have stopped by Burberry the other day and uh, picked up one of the famous Richard uh, shirts that uh, I definitely have clips and videos from and there's been, uh, I'm pretty sure some, there's some gifts on this one too. I know, you know, I'm not wearing it quite like Richard, but I do, I do have the, one of the Richard Burberry shirts that, that uh, he's wore. Man, somebody in the chat remind me of which interview. He's worn at least one or two interviews and maybe live streams himself. Anyways, I was like, I'm going to save it for Friday. I'm going to wear it then. Literally, I had my RH Maxi shirt on and I got into, I, I got into the room to the interview and I was like, wait, no, I'm supposed to wear Burberry today. And I went back and changed real quick. So you're welcome, everyone. I got my, got my shirt back on. Uh, got a shirt on today, which is always a good thing. But without further ado, we got we got a laundry list of stuff to go through. Very excited to have Grant on the show. Welcome to the show, Grant Cove. Hey, Max. Thanks for having me, man. Welcome, welcome, sir. Good to have you. How, you, how you dressing up for me? Appreciate the Burberry. Love it. This is this is for you. This is for you. This is if Richard happens to be watching uh, or or catches it later in the replay, gang. I'm here. Uh, Fair I had enough. To, had to bring Fair out enough. had to bring out a little bit of Burberry today. I, had to get, I don't. I'm not. I'm very simple guy. Usually it's just t-shirt, shorts, hat, you know, all that stuff. But every once in a while, I stop by Burberry and I, I glance inside and I think, hmm, should I today? And then I did the other day. So that's what happened. Yeah. Pulling triggers. I love it. Pulling it. Yeah. Grant, what's uh, so let's start there too. Like maybe you introduce people to a little bit of, of your background. I'm, I'm going to try to mention the green room. This is not going to be a rehash of other interviews. I've explicitly stayed tried to stay away from all the common questions, but I do want to give people just a, a little bit of fundamentals on you know uh, muse storytelling, where you came from, your background, and, and then we'll get into a little bit of how you came across Richard and got into this whole uh, this whole cr crazy film that we're uh, about to premiere. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the abbreviated versions of both stories, but Muse Storytelling as a studio was born when uh, Patrick was a psychology student at university in Canada and um, really was excited about what he was learning in psychology, but um, came to the understanding that if he wanted to change the world around him, have an influence, then he wasn't going to do that through academic paper writing. That, you know, people reading academic papers does not change behavior. Um, but story does. Story can affect us in a way uh, that it influences our behavior more than any other, um, you know, means of communication. And so uh, he wanted to immediately become a storyteller. And the uh, easiest way to do that is to be able to afford equipment and, and create movies. Um, and, and he was um, drawn to telling real stories. And so, you know, the, the way to do that is to get into wedding films. So that's what he did. Um, you know, invested in a, in an entry level camera, um, and started in wedding films and, um, uh, things quickly took off for him. And, um, he got really excited about making pretty pictures and then making engaging pictures and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and once you kind of master the wedding, the traditional wedding film format, um, it becomes pretty boring because it's about dresses and rings and vows and that kind of stuff. Um, it's about the wedding and it's not at all about the relationship. Um, and so he shifted everything on its head. And decided that he was going to create a really compelling story that just happened to take place at a wedding. Um, mm. And in that significant shift in, in seeing that differently, then he was able to, to cut his storytelling chops. Um, and, and the litmus test for his success was, can I show this film to uh, the mailman who's delivering today's mail? And would he be engaged enough to want to watch it? despite the fact that he doesn't know the bride, doesn't know the groom. And the last thing that he's probably interested in, you know, being drug into would be some wedding film. Um, and if the film could meet that criteria, then he knew he was successful. And in doing that, man, the wedding films that he started creating um, shook the entire industry. I mean, it took the world, the, the world of wedding filmmakers um, by storm. Um, and a bunch of people started peeping in on his work on Vimeo, including uh, the NFL network, um, and so they invited him in to see what he could do with football storytelling. And that was a hundred shoot day contract and, and um, some really outstanding work there. Then an executive at CBS Showtime saw both the wedding work and the football work and said, what could you do with a documentary about the army Navy football game? Um, and uh, spoiler, it went on to win uh, the best sports documentary Emmy uh, that year. So, um, you know, the, the story, the, the level of storytelling that Patrick's been on has just been an absolute trajectory 
um, with regard to, to, you know, kind of stepping outside of the expected, telling a really damn powerful story. And as a result of that, kind of shaking um, industries a little bit. Um, I intersect because I'm living in Cowtown, Ohio, um, and I'm putting my boys to sleep each night. And I realize that I'm not living that passion life that I wanted for each of them, that I'd put kind of my dreams on hold uh, a little bit, that I'd become complacent um, in, in my lifestyle uh, and decided I was going to draw a line in the sand and become a filmmaker. So I started doing what everybody else was doing, looking for inspiration on Vimeo and um, came across Patrick and um, saw the work that he was doing. It was like, I want to learn from that dude. Um, and he put on a workshop and, um, I went in person, um, and I kind of challenged the, the thinking from the back of the room saying, Hey, you're doing incredible stuff in wedding films. When are you going to do anything original? Um, and, uh, they tweeted out that they needed a production assistant once. And uh, I drove six hours, put myself up in a hotel, went to greater expense than they were paying, uh, did it at, you know, 30 some years of age. Uh, you know, schlepping coffee and, and grabbing tripods and lenses and doing whatever was needed. I'll hustled the rest of the, the, the crew and um, kind of uh, became a shadow um, to Patrick a bit. And um, so continued to travel doing production assistant work for him, um, which makes no sense whatsoever, right? I would drive nine hours, put the minivan in park at 3 a.m., kick back the seat, sleep for an hour, boom, the alarm would go off. It was a 4 a.m. call time, walk into the hotel and say, I'm here, let's go. Um, and uh, and then decided I wanted to tell that story, the story on complacency. I wanted to create a, a documentary about it. Asked Patrick to be involved. And he said, man, I'm going to pass. I, I, you know, it does, it doesn't, it's not good when a client is also in front of camera. Um, and so I said, fine, we'll do it anyway. Uh, gathered a team of five. Three weeks later, we were in a van. We traveled 10,000 miles across the country, um, explored through 50 interviews, complacency, why do we exchange our dreams for a scripted lifestyle, and um, came back with that footage, edited some of it, sent it to Patrick and said, can I hire you to help me edit? And he said, absolutely. Uh, moved the family to Mountain View, California for two months, edited the film, and basically became a shadow uh, to Patrick ever since. And in the... 10 years since then, uh, he and I have developed um, quite a unique relationship and, a, and a, um, a way, a means of working with one another where we can push one another to be better and therefore the work and the story to be its absolute best. And um, so uh, both born out of non-traditional experiences, we didn't come through, you know, UCLA film school. We didn't come mm -hmm. through any of those kinds of um, traditional paths, uh, but we definitely have come through the the path of hard work, sweat equity, um, making mistakes, you know, taking our lickings, and um, and you know, it's very exciting to be in the position that we're in today as a result. Incredible, incredible. I, you know, I think everyone loves to hear the story of people who you know come from nothing or come from don't have a traditional background or just otherwise, like you said, put in the sweat equity, put in the work, and just want to have something better, want to be a better version of themselves, want to like achieve something, not the complacency. It's an amazing, uh, amazing view into that as well. Um, it, it's just, I really like this. I think in the, in the community here too, just in the Hex community and Pulse Gen community, it's like, we really do appreciate that kind of just like, you know, uh, blue collar attitude as well. Just, just get it done. You know, it doesn't matter how it works. Like you do the work, you know, it's Richard's famous line too. You do the work. I'm not, I don't work for you. We don't work for him, but if you want to see something done, you do the work and, Man, that's, uh, that's setting quite the stage for for the for the next part too. It's just like I, I'm really curious how. So how did how did you how did you all come across Richard? And then how did you decide you want to be involved in such a story? Just just yeah, this massive so, thing that you broke open. So in addition to being filmmakers, we're also educators, um, and this is something that I kind of um, have picked up as a result of it being a part of Patrick's DNA. So as a result of you know Patrick doesn't just want to tell incredible stories. He wants to affect the world in the largest means possible. And at scale, that means that we need more and more and more better storytellers. And he also knows that so many people want to tell a story and they just don't know exactly how. And so as a result of that, in tandem with all of his filmmaking, he's always done filmmaking education. He's always helped other people become better at this craft. Um, and so as a result of that, then our circle of other filmmakers that we come into contact with is rich. Um, you know, we, we have a Rolodex of filmmakers that we can reach out to um, in, in like 
for sure every continent in the world and and more likely um more than two-thirds of every country in the world. Uh, we have someone who's, you know, we've spoken to through education or they've reached out to us and we've poured back into them in some significant way. Um, so as a part of that, then we're always getting um, communications from this community saying, hey, I've got a powerful story. I think that you guys should be the ones to go tell that story, right? So the inbox is flooded. It's full of opportunities to tell incredible stories. Um, for which we're entirely grateful, but it is a lot like mining for gold. It means that, you know, for every thousand different stories that we hear that should be, you know, remarkable, um, in truth, they just don't rise to that level of investment, right? In terms of time, energy, length, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and, and the origin story of this documentary is, is very much like that, where, you know, someone who, who we share uh, friendship with and, and passion in the filmmaking space, um, who was also aware of, you know, Richard, his projects and the Hexican community said, hey, guys, you guys need to go take a look at this. And um, and we just kept kind of, you know, poo-pooing it. We just kept saying, yeah, 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 whatever, man, whatever. And then it's like, here, like, check this link out or whatever. And we check out the link and it's, you know, Origin Richard, right? YouTube Origin Richard. He's standing in front of the red velvet backdrop. He's got the top hat on. You know what I mean? He's talking about how to give a better apology, like that kind of stuff or whatever. And you're just like, you know, no, hard pass, right? Like we're just not- Magician, a hard pass on the magician. Yeah, like, right. Like it just was, it just was, it was a lot, man. You know what I mean? Or whatever. And not in a great way um, originally. But then, um, you know, this friend just kind of kept saying, Hey, you really need to take a look at this. Like these things are developing. Like it would be, would be wild for you to understand what's happening. I think that I can just retire my grandmother. Like, you know what I mean? These kinds of, of conversations or whatever. And so it was like, all right, fine. We'll take a call. And, um, so we, Patrick and I were both on vacation at the time. We, we both agreed to take the call, uh, looked for the link, uh, discovered that we had to download an encrypted communication app in order to even have this conversation. Um, jumped on this conversation with Richard. Richard had no idea who the hell we were. Not exactly sure how, you know, Richard agreed to this uh, discovery call in the first place. We knew very little about Richard, like, you know, but it was worth like saying like, all right, you know, speed dating. <laughs> what, is there a thing here? Um, and at the end of that call, man, our heads were spinning. We didn't understand Richard or the space, but we understood one thing to be absolutely clear and that this guy was a character. And if you know story and what, you know, great with the components of great story, you know, much like the, the recipe of a cake, you're not going to have a cake without, you know, flour. And, you know, and, and so in, in terms of like it being the foundation of an incredible story, Richard was that. And so then it was like, yes, let's agree to spend a little bit more time to find out what this story is. Um, and uh, so we said, let's, we'll come visit with you in person for three days. Um, you know, send us your address and we'll show up at your house and let's go from there. And he's like, hold on donkey. Uh, I don't give away my address. In fact, I don't let anybody in the world know where I live. Um, but I'll meet you somewhere. Um, and I, you know, if he threw a dart at a uh, dart board or, or how he came to it, but he said, let's meet in Tallinn, Estonia. And so we did, we spent, uh, three days getting to know him, doing a baseline interview, having conversation around, is there a, there, there, and um, at the end of that experience, it was like, yeah, I think that this is something that um, we'd be willing to invest, you know, um, years of our life into creating uh, the story of this this token, its founder and its community. And so that's how we came uh, to even creating the highest of stakes. Yeah, I could imagine that, that Richard was trying to probably fill you all out. And, and a lot of people contact him as, are you, you know, a good actor, bad actor? Are you trying to tell a story or are you trying to, you know, get dirt on me, that sort of thing? And I can just imagine the interaction between you you two and, and or, or you three and just even meeting, even the, even the, uh, and just to be a fly on the wall or a fly on, at the cafe that you are meeting at, just to, just to hear that conversation would be amazing. Just that feeling each well, other out and then yeah, becoming definitely. This. Definitely a feeling out um, for sure. Um, I had flown separately because, you know, I, I don't um, live in the same area that the, that the studio is in. And so I commute to story. I, you know, I often um, travel alone and land at destination. Um, I had travel complications. So the rest of the team had already been with Richard for a short period of time. And 
And, you know, through all of the international delays or whatever, I'm schlepping my luggage with me to the cafe when I meet him. I hadn't even had the luxury of checking into the hotel yet. You know, so there I am, like cobblestone streets or whatever, show up to the cafe, like, you know, uh, in desperate need of a shower and a little bit jet lagged or whatever. And, uh, and it's like, Patrick introduces me, hey, Richard, you know, Grant's made it, right? Or whatever. And he's like, hey, and that was like it. And it was like, oh, okay. Well, wow. Are we a little distracted? What's going on here? Whatever. Um, now, I thought it'd be like, uh, a, hey, I'm Richard Hart. What's up? Yeah, and the relationship like, has grown, right? Since then, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, unquestionably. Um, but I, I, you know, I think you can understand where someone in his position is guarded um, and isn't going to, to immediately be vulnerable and let people in and, and that kind of a thing or whatever. So, um, yeah, those first, those first couple of days were a bit of, um, of, you know, emotional sparring, uh, around, you know, like, Hey, what, what's your intention? Um, what, what, you know, what's your qualifications, you know, um, how intelligent are you? Are you going to be able to keep pace in this space? You know, all of those kinds of things, um, for sure. Uh, I know that, that he was, and, and, and likewise, we were, you know, sparring back with, you know, is there a story? What kind of access can, can you assure us and, and demonstrate? Like what kind of a, of a Delta, is there any change that we can expect, um, from you or, or from this, um, token or this community? And, you know, so there are a lot of, of, of those kinds of things that we definitely had to, feel one another out on. Yeah. It, it's one of those things too, where I imagine that, that he is, you know, he, so at the time, so, so when, when did this happen? What, what time frame? When did you all first meet? Uh, I think, so I know that we it felt like we were um, all time highs at 23 cents ish, give or take. So this would have been like August uh, two years ago. Yeah, well, it's 23 right. cents now if you half the P-hex and E-hex. But yeah, it was around 50 cents was all-time highs. No, no, no. Uh, we were there when it was an all-time high of 23. Oh, right? okay. So not 23 Sorry. on the way down, 23 on gotcha. the way up, right? So, like, they were excited wow. because it was still making all-time highs. And, yep. and it had, you know, it was in that, in that vicinity, 17, 18, 19, up to 23, you know, and then bounced to, like, 27, then back down to 20, then back up, right? So it was in that yep. time frame. That's the time to be alive. I, uh, I've been just, just for context, too, I've been following Richard for since 2017. So his ideals, his products, when he came up with Hex and otherwise, and like all these different time periods have been so interesting. And you, you talked about when he was, you know, the doing the, the self help stuff. I came across that. And then you're talking about another era of it was making new all time highs. And I remember he was streaming so much back then. Every, it's like almost every day, it was like, ah, oh, new all time highs, new all time highs. And then he meets you all and to start uh, discussing and, and, uh, the forming this relationship to even start working on some kind of footage. I want, I want to get into that too. Like what was there a vision? So, so you meet him and you know, you, you eventually it sounds like you decide that this is, this is going to work. We can work together in, 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 in some way. And then you start progressing towards, okay, we have a character. What is it like? What story do we, do we want to tell? Or did you have a vision or to see how it ends up? Like how did, how did that process? Yeah. Go? So, so, um, you know, when it comes to the components of documentary, we know that there are some essentials. Um, and so, you know, you need to basically have a, a question in mind around, you know, um, are they going to win the game or are they not going to win the game, right? Is he going to climb the mountain free solo or is he not going to climb the mountain free solo, right? Are they going to be able to um, eradicate the, the porpoise harvesting um, practices or are they not right? Like those kinds of, of, of questions. And, and for us, um, you know, the, the larger question was, is this a scam or is it not right? Like, so, um, you know, that, and, and then in and around that, there are a host of other questions that ladder off of that, right? Like, like wanting to learn more about the community, wanting to learn more about Richard's origin story, like who he is as a person, what's created, the backstory and the conditions that have afforded him the opportunity to be the founder of this ERC 20 token, right? Like what, what's it like to be a no coiner and then come into the, the cryptocurrency space and specifically um, to make a large investment um, in, in Richard's ecosystem, right? So like there are a host of different 
thoughts and questions that kind of ladder down off of that larger idea. And as a result of that, then we knew that we needed to find people that fit those descriptions, right? Like we needed the, to, to, so we knew we had a founder. Now we need to know somebody who, who is like represents the community, you know, in the deepest way. We call that the OG hexagon, right? And so like, that's going to become our G3, right? We, we, we interviewed hundreds of people and, and we we're like, oh, you know what I mean? Like in terms of um, engaging with an audience and taking them along that ride, the journey of what's it like to be the, the truest of hexagons, right? That's, that's RG. And then it was like, okay, well, we need someone who can give us backstory because we want to share with the audience what, what is cryptocurrency and, and, and how did cryptocurrency come to be? And, and, and why would someone who knew of cryptocurrency be interested in something that RH was doing, right? And so that became Big K. Big K was like, look, I got involved in Bitcoin. You know, I didn't care for Richard when I first discovered who he is. And then this is the way that becoming involved in his ecosystem has affected my life. So that's another incredible insight and, and a look in without it having to be academic, right? Like we can we can educate you along that ride but it's true to someone's experience as opposed to being academic, as opposed to standing in front of a whiteboard and, and sharing that kind of ideology with you. Um, but then we needed, you know, to allow the audience to live in what an experience might be like to have made an investment in Hex and not someone who's looking at it in hindsight who said, you know, I've, I've done this, but somebody who we're along the ride with. Um, and so we had to, go in search of somebody who was about to make an investment. Like, you know what I mean? Like everybody's putting out their feelers and, and um, you know, very fortunate to, to have, um, you know, a, a family who was about to be in that position, I guess uh, the, you know, Mikey, who was about to be in that position, uh, whose wife unknowingly was about to be in that position, <laughs> um, you know, uh, say, yeah, you can come, come be a part of that experience for us. And so, you know, we were there when he made that investment and, and we follow their experience within that, that world. And that then affords the audience an emotional means of being invited into this space, right. As opposed to just remaining again, academic or historic. Um, but then the, the, one of the things that we had assured the community and, and that we knew is, is paramount to great storytelling is that, you know, storytelling lives in conflict. Right. It lives in that in that space of of wanting something and all of the things that stand in your way of that thing. And, um, you know, when we first learned of the Hexican community, the, the one thing that just came through again and again and again and again was this like chest pounding, this unapologetic chest pounding of like, like bring on whomever you want to bring on, invite them in the ring and let's talk about the, the, the structure and the performance of hex. Right. And, and, um, and so we went and, and in search of someone who was on that journey that wanted to take on hex and to, to examine it and to look at it for um, the, the potential that it is a scam. And to, you know, to really want to, to take that uh, charge on. And so we found a certified fraud investigator um, who had a desire to want to learn more about the cryptocurrency space, to discover that space and to, to make sure that um, she was in a position to help expose any scams that exist within that space. Um, and so uh, Dr. Kelly Richmond Pope, um, it, it, you know, goes on that ride um, and invites us in to her discovery and, and, and the work that she's doing to examine hex as a scam. And then in order to assure that she has the foundation that's needed to apply her fraud investigation techniques into the world of cryptocurrency, um, she invites a colleague, um, Lamont Black, Dr. Lamont Black, who is a, you know, a PhD um, in finance used to work at the federal reserve and, and now teaches um, master's level classes um, in cryptocurrency. And, um, and so he educates her, but then he also becomes a part of the examination and the, the discovery and in looking at hex as, um, as a scam. And so 
you know, you can see that that we have, you know, an, an incredible recipe here, right? We have like the eggs in place and the yeast and we have the, the binding agents and the milk and the sugar and the flour and the cream and all of the things that are needed to make a damn good cake. We have all of the ingredients to make a damn good story. And, um, and so, you know, in, in identifying all of those pieces, then it's our job to be present when any of them are, you know, making a discovery or having any insight or, or, you know, moving that needle forward, um, in order to, to be able to share that story with the audience. Yeah. I, I love the, uh, and people who've been watching the channel and, and know me too. It, it's, I love constructive criticism. I, I, I don't mind when people say, you know, investigate or, or, you know, uh, just try to try to say, Oh, hex is a scam or, or Richard's not doing the right thing or whatever. Even though I'm, I mean, being a RH maximalist, I'm, I'm very pro him, pro his ideals. I, I love it. I believe in his mission, glory, all that stuff. I think that I love seeing the other side. I love hearing both sides and then seeing that conflict take place. And then, okay, at the end of it, when the dust settles, what, you know, what, what is true? What is true for each person to do? I, I love the way that you, you all took that approach to, to the storytelling. Um, is, was there a time where when you got into it, maybe in the, in the beginning or halfway through or even towards the end, because that was a very interesting time when you know, Hex was hitting all, all time highs and going up and up and up. Eventually, as we saw, as the chart shows, it's been going down, down, down and up and down and sideways and all this stuff, macro conditions, you know, maybe, you know, different things going on too. But was there ever a time then where, where, where you thought, hey, is this story going to end the, the way that, you know, we thought it was going to end or is it going to change or how are, how are we, you know, we still want to tell the story, but, was there a time where you needed to like unbias yourself or like be like, okay, let's, let's maybe, maybe get into that a little bit. Yeah. So I guess the one, one of the things that I would acknowledge is that we entered this as non-biased as we possibly could. Um, so, you know, our biased lens is through the lens of story. Um, but, you know, we had no vested interest um, in, in, manipulating the story around success or failure, right? One of the things that we would acknowledge as storytellers is that either of the two being more powerful is arguably a stronger story, right? Like that's what's of interest in terms of, of looking at it from that perspective. Um, and so, you know, as we went along the, the ride, I think that, you know, we had some, some interesting moments around like, oh, this is looking, you know, shady AF. Like, you know, I mean, or whatever, is there going to be a smoking gun on the, on the backside of this? And then there's on the other side of it, it's like, you know, damn, if we had been involved in this thing from the origin, then, you know, we could be retired storytellers and never have to be in the position of taking on a story that we, you know, from anybody ever, right? Like basically you could have just uh, free rolled a production studio for life. Um, and so, you know, the, the scales uh, that, that, you know, back and forth and back and forth along that for months is, uh, is an interesting place to be, um, you know, no question. Um, and, um, and, and ultimately, I think that, you know, uh, uh, the understanding of the crypto space is, a, a, you know, a phenomenally attractive, uh, albeit landmine ridden landscape, right? And so like, it's, you know, I, I think that that's the, the kind of the the truth of this is that at any at any moment when you're on that, when you're in that landscape and you're playing, like there is definitely, you know, an oasis that is to be found. But you're going to have to sidestep all the landmines on your way. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's one of those. It almost feels like a. Uh, and again, I, I have no experience in storytelling or, or otherwise. But it, it, when I look at it too, I always think. Is it one of those, you know, newspaper is going to write a story about you. We want to interview you. But that at the end of it, you know, there's this betrayal of actually we're going to we found out the story that we want to go with. And it's not the one that's going to make you look best. It, I, I guess that's if, is, is there a yeah. way to apply that here, too? Is there a way where when you are like, whoa, it's the other side looking very interesting right now. I think that the I think that the one thing that we. We always entered in this with was the idea of it being a fair shake. So the whole idea from the word get, and the thing that we heard from the community 
And the thing that we as storytellers would always want to approach our work with is this needs to be fair, right? Like it can't be biased either way. We can't walk into this with an expectation of what the story is going to be one way or the other. Um, and that we need to, we needed to create an argument that, um, that afforded everyone the opportunity to form their own opinion that, that kind of followed that, the, that ideology of it's not a, it's not, it's certainly not a do your own research because th this documentary isn't academic in that sense. Right. But it is going to create in you, um, unquestionably a desire to go Google. Now, what do you put in the Google search terms is to be determined in the way that you receive the film, right? But you're going to, you can't not want to know more. Like that's, that's like unquestionable. I think in the same way that like, I really feel like some of the most incredible experiences in watching this film will be in the 90 minute to, to, you know, three hour conversations that happen with friends and family, you know, over coffee or at a drinking hole post film sitting with people who have just seen the film and saying like, okay, <laughs> let's talk. Right. Because I think that like yeah. that to me is, is, is going to, is the thing that you're left with is this like desire to want to communicate and just say, all right, let's, let's, let's work through this. And, um, and so, you know, for me, that's very exciting as a filmmaker because, you know, I, I feel like there, this entire cryptocurrency space as a whole is one that should be deserving greater attention than it's being given by, you know, my mom or, or my sons, right? Like that I think that we should, we should become more educated in that space than we currently are. Um, and, uh, and so that's what's very exciting about it this to me is that I think that this is going to force that um, for a lot of people, like in meaning it's going to create a lot of interest, organic internal interest is going to draw people like a moth into the space, as opposed to hitting them overhead, like a sledgehammer. Whoops. Sorry. Is that the uh, highest calling, if you will, for a storyteller to, to, to be able to, create conversation to, to, to either educate on issues one way or four, like, how, how do you, how do you look at that? That's it. Well, that's a really interesting um, question because I think that it's, it's specific to the filmmaker um, and specific to the type of film that they set out to create. Right. So like, if we think about the classics and you go, you know, you think about like jaws, um, or, or, or ET, um, or, you know, uh, Goodwill hunting, you know, and everything in between, right. The whole, the full spectrum, right. Like, and, and, and the, and Spider-Man and, and, you know, all of these things. Um, I'd say that it's hard to argue that there is, that all of the goals of each of those films are in singularity, right? Like even conversation isn't always the goal of each one of those individual films. Now, if we, just kind of say, okay, let's talk about documentary film, right? Okay. We can have a conversation around that. Now within that pie, how many slices exist in terms of the goals of the filmmakers? Um, and, you know, unquestionably there are some filmmakers, um, you know, I would say more notably your Michael Moore's, your, you know, uh, Spurlock, um, you know, that type of, uh, you could call it propagandist filmmaking, you know, within the, the genre of documentary um, has a more specific goal than just to create conversation, right? Like they're like, look, we want to, we want you to, to, to take on this line of thinking. Um, um, but um, as, as it comes to, to each film that we do, we said about, um, you know, these ideas of keywords and that, um, you know, the keyword isn't directly conversation, um, but can be framed that way where the goal of our film, um, in this instance, in creating this was, um, we want people to want to know more. We want people to, to be curious. We want people to self-educate. We want them to get involved in, in learning. 
So how do you how do you measure that? Is that just looking at you know after the film premiere is looking at the Google trends and searches? Like how do you how do you know if you've been or have you all well, thought about how think, how how you know if you're successful? I think that um, you know in a perfect world we'd have a a, a post film survey. You know what I mean? Like you'd have, a, have the ability to to actually like look at it and you know if you were to think of it as a clinician or you think of it you know. Um, in terms of what the commercial world calls KPI, right? Like, you know, you know, but what we would say is like, was it successful or was it not? And by, you know, what are you going to measure that by? I think that, you know, we could do a much smaller sample size of feedback in the same way that Nielsen does. Um, and we wouldn't have to pay for it, but we can just look at social. We can look at water cooler conversation. We can look at what happens around people's reactions to the film what kind of um, live streaming conversations take place post having seen it, um, what happens in, in online and print media around uh, this conversation. Does it, does it make the leap from um, the crypto knowledgeable into the world of the crypto curious and beyond that into the world of, you know, what the community so affectionately calls no coiners, right? The people who have ignored that space um, for so long. And, you know, can we permeate the conversations um, and, 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 you know, allow people to react to this story um, in each of those buckets? And, and the further it gets removed from, you know, the crypto enthusiast and more into, you know, the native, um, conversation of water cooler talk or country club talk or, um, you know, um, fellowship talk, those kinds of things like where, where it's finding its way into the halls of people gathering. Um, then I think that that would be how we could measure its success, right? Like my mom donates her time on a Monday afternoon to a thing that's called the, the quilt bunch or something like that. Right. If, or blanket bunch. That's what's called the blanket bunch. Um, and, and they, they just kind of spend their time creating crafts and things and then use those to raise money and donate them to, to worthwhile causes. If that group of ladies while doing their blanket bunch stuff on a Monday afternoon were to have an organic conversation removed from me having directed the film, right? Like this would be some other blanket bunch that exists to state over. And I have no close connection to them, but as an analogy, if, if that group of ladies starts and has a conversation one afternoon about this movie or this space, then that's success. Wow. Yes. I hope we get the, the, the blanket bunch. Uh, blanket bunch. The that's, that's, that's the, that's the wow. new metric. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah. Is there, is there something that dur during the filming, during the um, uh, production and, and post prod and stuff, something that you wish you would have captured more of or had more time or resources or you, you just had some constraint. You're like, ah, this is not going to make it, but you know, maybe in the next one, maybe we can do I something that, with it. I think that the constraint of, you know, early, early production was still under the, the constraints of pandemic travel restrictions and, you know, that landscape. And so, you know, we didn't have the, the latitude that you would be afforded today um, in, in covering this story. So I think that as a result of that um, would have been interesting to see what choices we could make um, beyond um, some of the more targeted decisions that we made um, as a, as a production team. Um, I think that the that while it it absolutely comes through in the movie that you know the level of success that people have seen as a result of these investments, um, I think that it would have been fun to have just been able to have played more in that space um, in in any investment decisions that people were making that had an impact on 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 opportunity as opposed to opulence, right? Like, like we see Lambo investing, but are we seeing people who could buy a small business cash and therefore 
leverage the kind of, you know, complete future financial freedom outside of the time lock that, that could be afforded. Um, like those kinds of things would have been, would have been interesting, but they're also very difficult to, to, to discover. And I'm not sure that they're entirely a true reflection of the choices that people are making. Mm. Like, I think that, that, you know, one of the things that, that I think maybe is, is, you know, um, a reality, albeit one that, that maybe disappoints me because I'm not a crypto maximalist is that, um, I'm not sure how many people are taking wild crypto gains and reinvesting them in more secure traditional financial models in order to create a, a landscape that removes the volatility. Mm. Right. Like, you know, it, it, and so, you know, that's, that's maybe the space that, that is, I'm just bringing my personal lens into uh, unquestionably. Yeah. Right. That like, just that's where my headspace goes um, uh, around this or whatever. And I, I wonder, I do wonder if that, you know, that's part of the reason that this movie excites me is because if there's someone out there that isn't awakened to it because they come from the traditional financial space, but they can be awakened to it enough that they're like, hold on. Like, I don't have to just YOLO every investment that I'm making in the cryptocurrency space. How can I, how can I become involved in a way that leverages what I'm doing over here? And then I can cross pollinate these two paths. And as a result of it, I can, I can, I can see some outrageous gains, but I'm not subject to the violent swings that come as a result of that. And, and what kind of financial independence can I create for myself, my family, multi-generational, and then how do I leverage that to do good in the world? Like, how do I really not just turn this, this into Lambos? How do I turn this into, you know, true community impact? Um, and um, yeah, anyway, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thinking that, that really gets me going is, is, uh, how can all of these pre-existing communities become aware of this other one in the same way? I, let me ask you this, Max, have you, are, are you embracing AI? Like is AI a part now of, of any workflow in your entire life? Um, I actually I think, used you know, it this morning. Yes. Yeah. Right. So like, but are you an AI maximalist? Are you, you know what I mean? Like you're having a conversation with mm -hmm. a human right now. If you were an AI maximalist, you wouldn't be right. Like I'd be an mm -hmm. avatar. And you know, like, so it's, it, to me, it's the cross pollination in the leverage of these tools that really get exciting around this, as opposed to it just being like tunnel vision blinders on, I'm only going to live in this lane and in this world. And so like, you know, I get really excited about all the ways that AI can cross pollinate all of these different industries and, and tasks and, and you know challenges that people face or whatever, and I, I I guess I apply that same lens to cryptocurrencies. It's like you know, in what way can that also be just a tool, and it doesn't have to be an entirely singular island and ecosystem. Yeah, I've talked about this before. That that's the hardest thing for you know people outside of crypto, no coiners or otherwise. To the biggest barrier to getting in is to, everyone just thinks it's gambling. Oh, this that's just the stuff that you 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 take your throwaway money and put it in, and you're probably going to lose it. Like getting over that barrier with products such as, you know, Hex and Pulse Chain and stuff, especially real world products. That's what's been so attractive and such a the message that, that our community has tried to send is, hey, this is not going to guarantee you get you rich, but at least you get a fair shot at it. There's, you know, there's no all the rug pull, you know, opposite the rug pull or the magic carpet ride, like all that stuff. That, like, that's what I want, at least. Like That's what draws me and keeps me in this community so much is I have a fair shot. I don't have a guarantee, but I have a fair shot at doing it. And uh, I think that's all we can ask for. And but it's so hard to get people to see that because most of crypto is failing over the last two years. You know, all the stuff that people actually communicate with, all the centralized stuff, all the you know bankruptcies, and all, they see that, and then they see everything else. They just see it go down, not down ninety percent, and they just they, they just think it's all gambling. But you know, there are some pockets, of some good stuff as as uh, you know we're aware of. Um, I wanted to ask you too. Just a few more questions. I want I want to keep this around an hour, so I don't want to take too much of your time. I really I, I want to dig on to um, just Richard a little bit, and because you know I, I think you all have got some really just 
just good time with him and it's stuff that, you know, I've never met him in person yet. I'm, I'm jealous of anyone who ever does and gets to spend time with him. It, did you ever have some moments or, or times where you felt like he said something or did something where you're like, whoa, like you just had this feeling of hope. Like you just had this feeling of, wow, this guy is trying to do something good. And the other side too, did you, did you ever have an experience where you just get a gut punch? Like, oh, well, that's, that's not, uh, that's not what I was thought this, how this is going to go. Like where, yeah, where, has I, there been I, wild I, swings in, in the uh, experience? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that there's some truth in that. I, I, you know, I think that there, in general, that's been my experience with people who are in the, in the arena, right? Like, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's very easy to, you know, sit on the outside and have opinion rather than being in the arena. Um, and, you know, I have two boys who play soccer. And so for the better part of the last decade, I've been on the sidelines, you know, in your little camping chair or whatever, um, yelling at the, the assistant referee and yelling at the center ref about everything that, you know, it's easy for us to have said they've done incorrectly. But in the last week, myself, both boys and my wife, all four of us attended referee training. And so we're all earning our referee certificates. Um, in fact, we've all just become certified um, as, as, as soccer referees. And as a part of that, you're going through, you know, all kinds of online quizzes, all kinds of education, in-person education. And then they throw live scenarios at you where you have flags in hand and whistles and balls and people are running and, you know, all that kind of stuff or whatever. And I'll tell you this, the safety of sitting on the sideline in the camping chair and watching the soccer game gave you the confidence to feel as though you knew every call and every call that was correct and wrong. The moment that you have that flag and that whistle and it's live play and it's on you to be making those decisions, um, it is a significantly, by a factor of more than 100x, more challenging, difficult, and the responsibility weighs heavy on you. Um, and so, you know, my insights into these, you know, moments from Richard where you have, you know, leveraged hope or leveraged despair right? They, they tend to be factored as well, right? Because you're getting them from somebody who's in the arena. It's not just speculative. It's not just sideline kind of um, conjecture. It's, it's somebody who's actually in there um, doing the work and, and needing to react to what's happening. And so um, interestingly enough, probably some of my largest hope and largest challenges in, in you know, Insight with Richard would come from him live reacting to something that's happening in the moment off camera. So we're in between, you know, moments that we've, we've chosen to film or whatever, and something comes through by a telegram or Twitter or, or a YouTube comment or something of the nature. And it's just his, his, it's the same reaction that you get from him when he's live streaming or, or when we captured or had conversations with him on film, like he's, he's, he's talking about each of those moments. Um, but it's that like, man, if you just have patience, like you don't even know what's coming around the corner, right? Like that level of um, faith in himself and in his own products to say like, hey, like long, long-term time horizon, he is, he is convinced of what, what, where this thing is headed, right? Like, and to hear him react to other people's, doubts or, or challenges, you know, just kind of talking to himself is, is interesting. Um, and then likewise, his frustration with, you know, continually being questioned or uh, the timelines that were, were being, you know, questioned um, or his own self-imposed deadlines that he continued to um, miss, right? Like those kinds of things or whatever are interesting because, you, you would know that like if he had expectation for himself and he's not meeting it, then that's an interesting leverage as well. Right. Like, um, and we all have been there. Um, like we've all, all experienced those things. Um, so, you know, I think that it's those in those moments of the in-between that, that those things became, you know, most clear for me around um, both the opportunity and, and the fragility you know what I mean? Of, of those opportunities. So um, yeah, I, I, it's, 
I think that people, people who have not yet had the opportunity to spend time with Richard, I think should take comfort in that. If you have spent time with him on stream, you've spent time with Richard. <laughs> like the man who is on stream is the man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, you know, what he's, what he's saying on stream is what he's saying when he's turned the camera off and he's walking, you know, um, down to the local cafe. Like, you know, it's, it's, it, Richard is always Richard. Like he wakes up thinking about the things that are important to him. He goes to sleep thinking about the things that are important to him. He puts his time and energy in only those things that he finds important. If he doesn't find it important, he's not doing it. Um, he has the, he has that level of freedom to focus on the things that he wants to, that so many other people aspire to. So many people look for financial independence because they go, I just want to be concerned about the things that concern me. I don't want to have to be concerned with the minutia of life. And he has found and created a lifestyle and an opportunity that affords him those things. Um, you know, uh, the, the interesting thing is, you know, is that what everyone would, would spend their time and energy focusing on if they were in the same position. And I, you know, um, garner to say that that's not true, that we wouldn't all think or feel or, or have the same priority that Richard does, but he's unapologetic in it. That's for sure. I think that that's one of the most critical things about financial freedom is just being able to own your own time, be able to focus on what you want to and not being told where to go, how to dress, what to do. Got to be here at a certain time. And not everyone would be, you know, a lot of people be lost. They really would because, you know, they, they either uh, don't have a lot of focuses in life or they don't know what they would do or they're just not in that. They never thought it's even possible to do that. But then there's also a lot of people who would say, if I just had the time back, if I didn't have to work and pay the mortgage and all this stuff then I could do other, other hopefully great things and, you know, be that force for good in the world. And that this community is full of both types of people. Uh, it's, just, it's just so fascinating to see that play out in a man who, you know, has been rich, retired forever. And now he's like, I have these things I want to do, like, and I have the time to do them. I have the brain to do them. I have the will to do them. Let me go, you know, let me go work on some key stuff in the world. It's been an amazing story to see um, on that part too. Do you, so we've, we've seen, again, I've been following Richard for six, seven years. I've seen the different phases too. I've seen him long hair in the dark live streams, eight hours of just being, you know, Bitcoin maximalist Richard. I've seen him go into, hey, I'm going to build this product. I'm going to get this community. I'm going to build this tribe with Hex and, and everything else. And then we're like, he's going to, okay, you know, he goes from, I don't want to buy anything. I got all this money. I don't know what to do with it to outrage marketing, product, Burberry, everything just want to get this message out, want to make people notice me in order for me to be more effective. And now, fairly recently, in the last few months or so, he's he's at least announced humble Richard, made a lot of changes. And those, I don't, I don't know if they're part of the film or not, but what what do you what do you think that, you know, you said Richard, you know, is the same, uh, is the same no matter what, he's the same on stream as he is in person how do you think his persona changes? Uh, are those, I mean, I always think they're just strategic. They're what is needed at the time for what he's trying to do. Are those an interesting part of his, his character too? What have you noticed around that? Um, when he submitted the trailer link, he was the one to say that, you know, what you see in the movie is different from the Richard that I am today. And we've not spent time with him recently. Um, and so, you know, um, I would, I would ask the Hexican community, um, you know, what do you, what do you make of it? You know, um, uh, certainly if you go back on Twitter um, and you, you look at the height of, you know, what he called outrage marketing. Um, there were a number of members of the community that said, Hey, like, we don't like, we don't care for this. We don't, we don't like this. Like, you know what I mean? Make a change, shift, do a thing. Um, I think that if you were to check the, the Twitter stream today, you'd see a fair amount of the community say, Hey, we don't care for what you're doing right now. Like we, we would expect a change from you. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I can't conjecture on anything that Richard is, is doing. Um, but I can reflect on what the hexagon community 
is doing on Twitter. And it looks like, you know, one of the things that has been true, and it's not the largest part of the community, right? It's a small um, percentage of the community, but there's always, regardless of the choice, there's always someone who finds that they want something different. Um, and so, you know, I think that's an interesting position um, uh, to be in as a community um, is, is to find yourself, you know, in that, in that truth. Yeah. Do you, I mean, have you, have you seen other, cause I just, I don't think I've ever seen anyone switch between personas based on, I get, I guess, you know, I, I always go back to a strategic, you know, he wants people to see him in a certain light and do a certain way to get something done. Have you seen other people? Is there, do we have other examples of either famous people or rich people or otherwise that have kind of tweaked what, you know, how they, how they operate or, you know, the kind of personality they put out there because of certain goals or do you feel like Richard is unique oh. in that way? No, I mean, I definitely think that, that there are a, a host of people in leadership positions, um, whether they're public facing or whether it's internal to an organization or, you know, like I can even think of myself as a, you know, in my relationship with my sons, the way I present myself to them has evolved and changed over time. Right. And as a result of that, you know, and it's purposeful, uh, some of it, some of it's just cyclical, right. Some of it is the byproduct of my own experience or maturity or, or experience or, um, my personal new level of affluence, right. Like in terms of uh, success or whatever, meaning I can offer them more resource than I could before. Like there's a whole host of, of factors that play into the way that we choose to greet the world and the way that we choose to, to present ourselves to that, to that world. Right. And so I think that, you know, in, in every relationship, I think that there's always the dynamic of change and growth and shift and, and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, in terms of it being calculated and, and having, you know, um, chrysalis, you know, like kind of incubation or any of those kinds of things or whatever, um, for sure, those, those there are countless examples that exist in the world um, in and around that space. I mean, like I think of, you know, one person that comes to mind and I'm not trying to draw an analogy to Richard in any measure. Um, unfortunately, this person, the analogy that comes to mind is also financial, but um, the Wolf of Wall Street, right? Like comes to mind in terms of, of, um, having been able to, to reinvent a perspective or a place inside of that, that financial world. Um, so, you know, yes, I think that, 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 that possibility exists, um, unquestionably. Um, but you know, on a, on a completely different level, look at Taylor Swift, like the way that she first greeted the world as a, as a musician was very much through the lens of the country music scene right? Like she was a country music artist. Uh, I, I dare say that there are very few people that see Taylor Swift as a country music artist today. She's a, a, a singer songwriter, pop musician that is setting records with the, the amount of income that she's seeing, you know, in concert. So like, you know, I, I think that, you know, there was a period of time where she kind of was, was off of the radar there too before coming back. So, you know, yeah, I think that there are countless uh, examples of, of people who have had that kind of um, an experience or journey. Yeah. I think a lot of people it's just either confused by it or thinking, Oh, it, you know, like you said before, they, they're going to like it. They're not going to like it. They're going to have, have expectations, which we don't do in this community uh, of any sort. So it, it's always interesting to explore that and just kind of, you know, kind of get into like what, what his, we, we all love to see the Richard Whiteboard, the, the war room of all the different stuff going on and ideals and, and the, all the work he's not doing for us. But uh, it's just so fun to think about the, the, different, the different things he's trying to do. And yeah, and we'll wrap up on one more on Richard too before we you know, show the highs of stakes coming out August 4th. Um, what do you think, you know, his mission, I know you got to know him at least a little bit over the filmmaking and stuff too. Uh, you know, he says he wants to, he wants to have glory, right? Like he's, he's in it for glory. He wants to, I, I speculate, wants to be, you know, known as one of the greatest men. He wants to do great things, longevity research, all that stuff too. Um, 
what what do you think his of his intentions, his actions, his his ability to affect change? Like, are you are you long Richard Hart stock overall? I'm personally speaking, like, what, what has been your 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 uh, evaluation? I, in truth, I don't know. <laughs> like, um, and and I think that you know to use vocabulary in from the crypto space, it's early, you know, it's, it's early. It's in the same way that it's like, you know, um, on draft day in the NFL, NHL, MLB, NBA, right. You have a room full of owners and GMs and a talent pool that has, you know, been, that's in its infancy, but it's not right. Like, you know, these scouts have been identifying the talents of these athletes since they were eight and now they're 18, right. Or they're 24 and, and they've been following them for the better part of 10 years or more in terms of their experience, their pedigree, their, their accomplishments, their, their weaknesses, their strengths and everything in between. And, and then they have an opportunity to schoolyard pick their team, right? It's like playground and it's like, who are you going to choose to be on your team first? And, you know, and the captains are picking them and, and sorting them and, and um, who knows, man, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> Steph Curry's NBA scouting report had him as a three-star recruit, not a five-star recruit, not the kind of person that, you know, wasn't just going to be hall of fame, but was going to be the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA. Right. So like um, I can guarantee you that at that exact same period of time that, that, you know, somebody was choosing Steph Curry to be on their team. There was somebody else whose, whose stock was so much higher. Right. And, and in truth, it was just too early, it's too early to speculate on the performance of either of them. Right. Because it remained to be seen too many variables you know, so much of it is about like future focus, future energy, future opportunity, like so many variables in terms of what someone will or won't do. Um, in fact, I'd say that's true of me. Like, mm. am I long on myself? Huh. I hope so. Right. Like, I really hope so. But in truth, I'm going to have a whole host of personal uh, challenges that I'm going to have to overcome in order to execute on that long vision of myself. So, you know, to be able to, to speculate on the behavior of somebody else, I have difficulty enough speculating on my own. That's a great way to put it. it certainly is. I, I think we can only, I guess, you know, if, if we want Richard to succeed, we can only hope that he's taken the steps to do that. He probably knows a lot more about us than, you know, on that side of what it takes uh, to do a lot of these amazing things and to you know, stay out of trouble and, to, and just to really execute if he wants to, you know, accomplish these things. Wow. I don't know. I don't know if I want that pressure on my shoulders. I'll say that, but uh, we, uh, I certainly, I certainly hope uh, we, we see a million followers and uh, Richard for president or something, uh, something amazing happen in the 2020s. Like, uh, yeah, I cool. do too. I do too. So on the film, we'll get you out of here on this. What, what should people know? Uh, you know, I know we got a ton of screenings. We got Regal uh, on board, at least for, it sounds like a, a Friday and Saturday next weekend. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this stuff, but like what should people know uh, going to the film before they see the film, how to get access? What, uh, what can you tell us? So um, the easiest way to find uh, the available screenings in your area is to go to the highest of slash screenings. Or if you just go to the highest of you'll find the screenings button. So when you go there, you'll see all of the cities listed that we're, we're, you know, in all of the different markets where the film is available, choose the one nearest you. And then from there, you can choose the dates and search for availability. Here's what we do know. We're already sold out in, in eight or 10 markets. We have been held over in 22 markets, which means that we're not only available the first weekend, we're available an additional weekend, right? Um, once a screening gets sold out, if there's an additional, if there's additional pressure there, then Regal's been a great partner in creating additional screenings. So as an example, if you're in New York City, uh, on the 4th, you're not limited to just one screening. There's a 7 o'clock, and then there's also a 
screening. Same night, the first one got sold out. So they added a second showing. So um, what we really need you to do is just to go search the availability in your own area. That means a lot because that pre-sale pressure is already gaining the attention of Regal. Um, what we're really interested in seeing is like once people have seen the movie, what happens in creating snowball effect, right? Where you're inviting additional friends and family, you're wanting to go back. And this time you're wanting to bring people with you the second time in order to see that showing. So, um, it, you know, there have been some community members that have had a tremendous amount of um, uh, initiative and they're going in and, and they're bulk buying tickets and they're gifting them to people, um, you know, which we support if that's something that you're interested in doing. You may not resale them and you may not buy them and gift them out predicated on behavior. Okay. So it would literally just be just, a, you know, no expectation. We know those words, right? In this community, it would just be like, hey, I'm handing these out and we want, we want full theaters. We also want full theaters. Don't just buy a theater and let it sit empty. If a ticket's not going to go used, don't purchase and gift that ticket. There is no uh, additional um, value in seeing empty theaters that, you know, on, 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 that look sold out, but they're not right. Um, this is about getting people in there and getting them to experience the film. Um, additionally, there is, I know, um, uh, a wallet that has been uh, created. If people are so inclined to want to just support the marketing efforts of the film. Um, and this is kind of that top of mind marketing. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the different layers and metrics of, of marketing and how all of that works, but <clears throat> in addition to people seeing the film, sometimes it's very helpful if people can see visual cues out in the world that support and offer a room, you know, oh yeah, I've heard of that. Oh yeah, I see that. Oh yeah, you know, so billboards and bus stop posters and, you know, those kinds of things um, are in the works. We already have them in some of the special markets and we would be looking to make additional investment in additional markets if the community finds that to be of importance to them. So we're willing to facilitate, you know, the, the specific like approved um, kind of marketing that's going on in those places. And if the community desires that they want to have it put in there, then we're welcome to facilitate that. So there, I know that there is an address um, on Twitter that you can find in order to support that if that's important to you. Um, otherwise, it's about getting people to see this thing. And, um, you know, use whatever methodology you can in order to, to, to gain support. Uh, you know, I think that it's most powerful when you're reaching out to people that, you know, um, and then you allow that kind of, um, that organic growth to happen, um, within that, within those means. So there's a, Beautiful. There's a you hear it, Hexkins, you do the work and re how can they reach out if they have, uh, if people want to donate or, or capital so these, or, or otherwise? I, I know that there's a hello at the highest of stakes.com email, um, but also Twitter uh, at the highest of stakes is a, is a, um, an active uh, means of, of getting our attention as well. So um, you, we, we're pretty responsive. So, you know, if, if you have an idea, a question or an, uh, you know, a thought, don't hesitate to reach out. Just know that, um, you know, there are some very specific things that we have to be restrained to around this, right? We don't want to jeopardize uh, or misrepresent the story, right? We don't want this story to be misrepresented as a puff piece. We don't want this to be right. misrepresented as, you know, anything that it's not. And so um, we're very careful to, to make sure that, no one else is um, aligning or assigning some kind of a framing to this that is that you know is outside of the truth. I, I love the integrity you are keeping towards this and all all the work that's went into that. Um, amazing storytelling. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. This is selfishly, I have one more question too. Yeah. If we cannot, if you're in the uh, unfortunate group of people who will not be around or near a theater to see it that uh, particular next next weekend, is is there, how do, how do you watch it? If you don't watch it next weekend at the, at the theaters that are near you, how do you see it afterwards? You climb in your car and you drive to where you can see it. <laughs> That's the short answer. I may have now. to swim. It's convenient. May have to it's, swim. It's the convenient short answer, right? If yeah. Or swim. Um, if it's, uh, I would say that we are, we are working to gain additional distribution. Um, we're actively, you know, the team is, is very much so working toward that. Um, 
just as a as a proof in in what we're doing to try to get this out to as many people possible is um, we went from the seedling of an idea of being able to to get this in a select few theaters to immediately being able to expand that idea into um, 25 markets, which grew to 29 markets before we even went public. And then after the public launch, that grew to 40 theaters, which is immediate in weekend one. And then we've expanded that into weekend two and 22 additional markets. And we've added additional screenings in the sold out markets of a dozen or so. So you can already see that we're doing everything that we can to add water to this Chia pet and just continue to watch it grow lovingly, right? As much as it possibly can um, with the desire to see this thing just take over prairies. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing everything that we can to get this thing out. We are going to um, be wanting to create as much attention as we can through theatrical release in order to find the right on, on you know, streaming partner, um, online streaming partner. And so, um, be patient with that process. We're only weeks away from this thing already having been out and being held over and the reactions to the film and everything else in between. Um, probably your shortest, I don't know. I that's not a fair predicate. Uh, if you buy a limited edition box set, it comes with a DVD and a Blu-ray. Don't know. What, which will happen first, whether the delivery of those special edition boxes will align with online streaming or whether it will come before online streaming actually activates. Um, but that would be another way to assure that you uh, could see the film in the comfort of your living room um, immediately is by ordering one of those. And, and I know that we are uh, meant to have those uh, prior to uh, the end of Q4. Um, and again, that's, you know, we want to beat that deadline for sure, but just, uh, assuring you that that's possible as well. Um, and we're doing everything that we can in every uh, uh, reach of the world. We're doing everything that we can to, to, to gain and, and provide additional distribution. Yeah. I mean, we got people in Europe and Asia and, and everywhere just trying to, to watch this. Is, is it is streaming? Are we talking maybe weeks after the premiere or months or it, is this still just up, up in the air? Man, I can't, uh, you know what I mean? Like it would be, it would be uh, in, in what I've experienced so far, it would be unfair of myself to hold an expectation. Like, right. No expectations. So, yeah. I mean, in truth, no expectations. And I'm, I'm, I'm even living that right now myself. So, you know, like, um, so yeah, yeah. The, the, the fun of it is it, we're, you know, we're in the world next Friday. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Now select parts of the world. I get it. I understand. Like, you know what I mean? Or whatever, but get a, um, get a plane ticket. Come on over. But it's happening. It's happening. Yes. Yes. Um, where can, what, what do you ask you and Patrick have any other interviews? Are you going on any big shows, bit boy? Do you have any, uh, any other? We'll be on the going up to tonight. FNA. Okay. Nice. Yep. Be on, on the, the FNA uh, discourse tonight. Tonight. Yeah. So, awesome. uh, so join us then for sure. It'll, it'll be a big old party. Like it's, it's just, it, that one's not just a one-on-one. -on -one. That one's going to have uh, a whole host of different people. So um, yeah, join us for that. Yes. Shout out Discourse Syndicate, RG3 Connects, all the folks over there, F and Hangout happening. Um, thank you so much, Grant, for joining us. It's, it's been a very pleasurable conversation. Uh, really awesome. got to, again, I, I wanted to dig into a few areas. I, I know, you know, people have certain places they want to cover, but I really wanted to get, tell the story or get you to tell the story of how this thing came together. And also just, just talk about Richard a little bit. Like that's the thing people, I know I'm, I'm in particular, I'm always curious and fascinated with people having time with him and, and his different uh, style and nuances, but uh, I'm so glad you could have a conversation about it with us. You, you, you should, you should name your channel with your passion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I should, I should think about that. I'll, I'll think, think about, about that. that huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank well, you, I'll man. Try appreciate to, you having on, Max. Of course. I'll try to, again, everyone, uh, check out the F and Hangout tonight. Uh, Grant will be on there. And maybe I'll try to stop in the chat there as well. And, uh, and That'd be fantastic. Hang out. Yeah. All right, yeah. everyone. Sci-Vive and 5555. Five, five, five. We are out.